Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. This week, we've had a lot of interesting news. So DDR5 is one of the major items where Samsung is looking at 512 gigabyte DIMMs. Kind of insane. We'll also be talking about NVIDIA changing up its silicon die names by striking through the previous one and updating it. Uh, we'll be going over CD Projekt Red's updates for Cyberpunk 2077 and a couple of other items like Microsoft making some changes to Windows 10, memory prices, and industry factors that we need to look forward to. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Tower 100. Thermaltake's Tower 100 is a mini ITX case to serve as a showcase system for your components. The Tower 100 has received many revisions since we first saw it, and the case now has an open vent in the bottom for intake, a mesh cutout in the side panel for some GPU ventilation, and additional mesh along the side skirts and the side panels of the case. The Tower 100 is mostly focused on building a showpiece PC that's small enough to fit on most tables. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first news item for the week is Samsung and its DDR5 updates. Actually, Team Group has some news too about its own DDR5 modules. Uh, there are only a couple of memory suppliers in the space, as many of you likely know. So Samsung is probably among the biggest. SK Hynix and Micron are also large memory suppliers. There are a couple of other flash suppliers out there. To some extent, Nanya is relevant, certainly in the SSD space. But for memory, it's those big three. DDR5 development has been forging ahead within the industry for some time now, and as such, we have developments from a couple of those groups. Samsung announced that it has 512 gigabyte DIMMs that are rated for 7200 megabits per second, and it's also using its high K metal gate, or HKMG technology process. Samsung isn't talking about the specifics of HKMG materials right now, but Samsung's HKMG process involves using a high K dielectric instead of silicon dioxide. The idea of using high K dielectrics isn't new. Intel used them, for example, with uh, 45 nanometer process, with half name specifically, and would go on later to deploy them at 32 and 28 nanometers. As the insulation layers thin with shrinking process, leakage becomes a greater concern. To that end, Samsung says its new DDR5 modules using HKMG are capable of using 13% less power, as well as reducing the leakage. Samsung is stacking eight layers of 16 gigabit, with a lowercase b there, DRAM chips, by using through silicon vias, or TVS, interconnects to reach a capacity of 512 gigabytes for a single module. As a quick reminder here, just because it is a really common mistake that we see in the comments every day, uh, bits and bytes are significantly different. So if you see a lowercase b on one, this is like really basic, like computer engineering high school level stuff, but uh, bits is going to be one eighth of a byte. There are eight bits in a byte. A lowercase b is a bit, and a capital B is a byte, and then there's an asterisk on all that. Sometimes it's 10 bits, but basically it's, it's normally eight bits in a byte. Just to make sure everyone's clear on that. So when you see 16G lowercase b, that's what we're talking about. Uh, Samsung noted that it's currently sampling DDR5 products, and it said that it's working with select customers right now for validation and verification purposes of the spec and of the functionality. And as always, there's going to be a slower adoption period for consumer with DDR5, enterprise and server, very likely to pick it up first. And then in the consumer market, we'll get it a little bit later. Now, as for Team Group, Team for its part is preparing its T-Force branded overclocking D5 modules. Uh, Team Group has previously completed validation and testing for DDR5 so dims that'd be the laptop memory, and UDIMs, and it's now moving on to testing overclocking memory with motherboard partners like ASUS, ASRock, MSI, and Gigabyte. As we've discussed before, the introduction of DDR5 will see power conversion and management for the memory subsystem moved away from the motherboard and onto the DIMs themselves. This will come in the form of power management ICs, or PMICs. PMICs should allow for far more granular voltage and current regulation as well as voltage adjustment, which helps with the power management specifically. Team Group claims that its modules will have a voltage headroom of up to 2.6 volts thanks to its onboard PMIC, well above the 1.1 volt requirement for JetX DDR5-6400 spec. Team Group didn't offer any information on the PMICs themselves, but the P8911 PMIC for client DDR5 applications is ready to go. Team Group also didn't mention when it would be shipping its D5 modules, but given AMD and Intel are expected to embrace DDR5 in late 21 or early 2022, it shouldn't be long at this point. And if you're worried about, should I wait to buy a motherboard until DDR5? A couple things to remember here. Uh, this is a question we've seen. I've personally been in the industry paying attention to it for two cycles now uh, in terms of memory. So the rollover point for memory 
when you start getting a mass adoption, mass switchover from the previous to the new one, tends to be about the 18 month mark in our experience doing this. Uh, sometimes it's up to the 24 month mark, but there's a bit of a delay in the adoption. And remember that when new memory comes out initially, it's not the best memory, whereas DDR4 that we have now is about the best it's ever going to be. And it started off significantly slower and worse than where it is today. So although DDR5 will in some ways be an immediate and obvious upgrade, like in the power management uh, and with some of the ECC changes, it is going to take a little while to mature to a point where modules become reasonably priced that are also high performing. So keep that in mind. You don't need to necessarily switch right away. Uh, if you have a specific reason to wait for the memory, then go for it. If you don't know why you would need to wait for it, then you probably don't need to, other than maybe if you want to keep a platform running and upgrade in socket for a while. But the, the upgrades in socket are kind of limited to maybe two generations, three generations, if you're on AMD, if AMD repeats what they did last time, uh, something to that extent. So anyway, that's the uh, DDR5 story. NVIDIA up next, and it's silicon name changes. So NVIDIA, it seems, uh, as evidenced by a Hardware Lux member, we're going to go with ISO Zero here, who purchased an RTX 3090. It seems NVIDIA is striking through some of its names and changing them on the silicon. So on the Hardware Locks forums, ISO Zero disassembled a 3090 to install water block and posted the photos. In the process of removing the cooler and the shroud, the user discovered that the previous GA102-250 KDA1 marking had been crossed out and a newly etched GA102-300-A1 was underneath it. While the reasoning for this isn't presently clear, it seems that the naming of NVIDIA's GPUs is being shuffled internally on account of the unreleased RTX 3080 Ti. Now, the 3080 Ti was a rumor for a long time. Many of you likely remember the discussions of it back in, it might have been as, as early as October, November. And we reported in January that it was indefinitely postponed. To be clear there, indefinitely meaning with no definite time, but it might still arrive. And uh, the reasoning for the indefinite postponement was because NVIDIA was trying to accumulate silicon and get it to market in its existing SKUs, i.e. the 3090 we're talking about in this story, so that it could meet some form of demand and not continue to get beaten over the head by everybody for having no supply of its products while then diversifying and segmenting its product portfolio further still with a new SKU. So that's why the 3080 Ti was definitely postponed originally. And our understanding right now is that the rumored 20 gigabyte SKU for the 3080 Ti, it sounds like is dead. Uh, I, this is rumored and conjecture territory where it, this is stuff we've heard from people at NVIDIA off record, so can't speak to how it'll play out ultimately. But it sounds like the 20 gigabyte SKU was killed and they're bringing it to 12 gigabytes, which would be up from 10 on the 3080, but uh, that's what happened. So. The GA102-250 die, or rumored GA102-225 die, uh, was what was rumored for the 3080 Ti at some point. For now, it seems that the 3090 SKUs, some of them might be shipping with a newly christened GA102-300 naming. And uh, this relates back to our, again, the uh, previous discussion on the 3080 Ti postponement. So it, basically, our takeaway from this is that maybe NVIDIA was starting to produce silicon for a 3080 Ti and then stopped and said, wait a minute, people are really not happy right now. Let's just put these into something else and keep our heads down and try to ship what we've already announced. Intel reportedly considering process node numbering changes, citing confusion. In a new report from the Oregonian, we checked their YouTube channel for pronunciation, but they also don't know how to say it because they didn't say it in the video that we checked. It seems Intel is considering making changes to how it classifies its process notes. According to the outlet, Dr. Ann Kelleher, who serves as senior vice president and GM of Intel Technology and Manufacturing, has notified employees that Intel intends to change how it identifies and labels process notes. Quote, it's widely acknowledged in the industry that there is inconsistency and confusion in nanometer nomenclature, and it doesn't reflect the latest innovations at the transistor level. 
said Intel spokesperson Chelsea Hughes, plus, 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 to the Oregonian. This has been the source of much debate over the last several years as transistor geometry continues to shrink. Intel has floated ideas in the past of how to better measure its chips and their features, plus, plus, and has opined that current nanometer plus numbers are not an accurate plus, plus representation of the actual transistors, plus, 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 mostly in reference to nanometer numbers smaller than its own looking better because they're smaller. One of Intel's better ideas was to gauge chips by measuring plus their density plus plus across a given area while also factoring SRAM cell size. We're curious when Intel is going to move to other functions in math. Perhaps we can get some calculus thrown into the names next time when we need to refresh 14 nanometers, although it does look like they're finally moving past that. Additionally, about a year ago, uh, we discussed some very interesting research into a new way to measure semiconductors that would also account for density. So it's not just a matter of nanometers versus picometers. It was a matter of measuring the density too, which is important because uh, 14 nanometers versus 10 versus 7, it means something, but it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, it, it does not show the full picture. So uh, for a long time, Intel was bragging about how it's 10 was better than AMD 7, which, okay, cool. You gotta have 10, though, for that to actually matter. <laughs> if you're on 14, it doesn't really matter that your 10 is better than 7 because your 10 is theoretical. So this uh, research that we reported on last year was specifically talking about accounting for the density part of the equation that can make that statement of 10 better than 7 true. The proposed metrics from back then would include logic, memory, and connectivity, and would be known as the LMC metric. The LMC metric could be listed alongside a manufacturer's process node uh, for the number or the name and serve as a common metric across different manufacturers and processes. No word yet on if Intel will also consider renaming its processors, that the names that the consumers have to say, which is actually the far more confusing aspect of the equation. Up next, CD Projekt Red has shipped patch 1.2 for Cyberpunk. This is actually a massive patch and we are not currently using it in our benchmarking, but we'll probably move to it in, well, whenever it makes sense to move to it after we see some of the reports on how it's working out. But this patch was initially slated to be pushed out in February. It got pushed back as a result of the ransomware attack on CD Projekt Red. And uh, there were some actually insane conspiracy theories that CDPR hacked itself to then ransomware itself so that they had time to push back the patch as if CDPR is afraid of delaying things. That's probably very far from the truth, but they claimed that the delay for this patch was because of the ransomware attack, which makes sense. The entire change log is listed in the patch notes. It contains hundreds of fixes and changes. Uh, with some notable changes being PC specific, but there are several that are console specific as well. Cyberpunk 2077 was very broken on the past gen consoles, and this patch focuses heavily on improving the game on the PS4 and the Xbox One. The patch lists countless bug fixes, but there's also some quality of life stuff and gameplay improvements as well. There are some tweaks to the physics and NPC AI behavior, which were both widely criticized. We we can't imagine why. We definitely didn't encounter any weird NPC AI or behavior in our playthroughs. Hopefully there's some on the screen now. There's some other non-bug related improvements as well in here. Most notably for the PC crowd is the addition of ray tracing support for Radeon hardware, as well as expanded key bindings. But the Radeon hardware DXR support is genuinely interesting. CDPR notes users will need the latest Radeon drivers, but you'll also need an RX 6000 series card, uh, which should be no surprise at this point. Overall, the reception to the patch seems to be going well with a noted improvement in game stability and overall performance on older consoles. However, the game and CDPR still have a long way to go. In fact, the company recently detailed how it'll handle games development and marketing going forward following Cyberpunk's, fair to say, botched launch at this point and basically said that it's going to keep things quiet until closer to launch, which we would agree is a wise move. Up next, Microsoft is testing a device usage page for Windows 10. So historically, operating system updates haven't necessarily been too interesting, but there have been a few that were worthy of discussion, like the GPU scheduling stuff. Uh, in this one, Microsoft's been internally testing a device usage feature. This might not roll out to a final version. It's in testing for a reason. But this is within the Settings app in Windows 10, 
which is a horrible plague on what used to be the control panel. And the intent is to offer a more customized experience and optimizations based on the user's machine and how they've configured it specifically. While the news that Microsoft has been testing this feature for a while isn't new, the ability to enable it in the preview builds, if you're part of the preview track, is. Windows Latest was able to turn the feature on in a preview build in one of their virtual machines and noted in a report that uh, it said, quote, get customized suggestions for tools and services based on how you plan to use your device. Initially, it looks like users will be able to select from a few different use cases, gaming, family, creativity, schoolwork, entertainment, and business being among them. However, it's not clear what Windows 10 and Microsoft will do to tailor the experience once users have selected their category. Currently, Microsoft is just testing the feature and it may be left on the cutting room floor before it's all over. If it goes well, the feature may ship with Microsoft's upcoming Windows 10 overhaul, codenamed Sun Valley. Sun Valley is set to be the largest update Windows 10 has seen in years, and it's expected to arrive later this year. We'll probably have to update test benches for that. We typically run uh, one of the latest versions of Windows 10. We'll skip really minor updates, like some of the small KB stuff. But we do update for major ones for test benches, and this will be one that we'll have to update for. And we'll probably test it if it looks interesting too, if it makes it. Next story is about DRAM price changes. This, it's an ebb and flow for memory prices. Seems like every couple years it'll come back into the news as a major topic for a few months and then subside. But DRAM prices right now, according to Digitimes via TrendForce, TrendForce is one of the leading trackers of the actual contract price of the memory being sold. Uh, DRAM prices look like they're going to continue to rise through quarter two, 2021, like everything else right now. And according to Digitimes and TrendForce, the DRAM contract prices are already up by three to eight percent. And that's as we exit Q1, the prices look like they're going to swell to a 13 to 18 percent boost by second quarter of 21. And the overall demand for DRAM chips remains strong right now, despite a pretty hard dip last year. Demand is coming from all markets and all sections of the market, but at slightly disproportionate paces. PC DRAM remains among the strongest sources of demand, especially for PC OEMs, as they continue to stock up on inventory ahead of price hikes. This is actually really interesting because PC OEMs are the most influential to our specific space. A lot of times you'll see server being one of the major memory consumers, but in this case, because of the sudden increase in interest in desktops and laptops to some extent, we're seeing a higher uh, increase in memory sales too. OEMs. Additionally, TrendForce notes that the server market is beginning to pick up and also gearing up for what's considered peak season for data centers and servers. TrendForce notes that DRAM contract prices for servers will go up 20% sequentially. Mobile DRAM is also seeing an increased demand and contract prices are expected to rise here as well, but not at the same pace as PC or server DRAM. Meanwhile, TrendForce states that mainstream 8GB DDR4 modules could rise in price by as much as 15% during second quarter while four gigabit DDR4 chips uh, and their prices have rallied by more than 70% over the last two months. Also two gigabit DDR3 chip prices have more than doubled since January. And it seems that DRAM contract prices will continue to rise throughout the course of the year. But the rise is expected to slow down during the third and fourth quarters as hopefully the global chip shortage improves. The next story is about TSMC. TSMC has been in the news nonstop for the a long time now. It's become a major force in the industry. It's now worth more than NVIDIA and AMD combined. It might be more than, I think it's close to Intel and NVIDIA combined. Their market caps are, are all high, but TSMC's is the highest right now. So TSMC is apparently a, a head of schedule for its N4 process node. There are a couple of reports we spotted where uh, TSMC's volume production is expected to ramp for quarter four 2021 for the N4 process specifically. TSMC has a number of process nodes in development right now, including three nanometers which has been in discussion and it's expanding its fabrication capabilities and facilities. Those will be online over the next couple of years. Previously, TSMC's N4 process wasn't expected to hit volume production until the first half of 2022. So this is a significant head start, assuming the veracity of the reports anyway. TSMC's four nanometer N4 node is something of an evolution of its five nanometer N5 node and serves as a stopgap between five nanometers and three nanometers. One of the reports referred to N4 as, quote, part of the four nanometer family of five nanometers. 
This seems similar to what TSMC did with its 6 nanometer N6 node, which was a continuation of its N7 process at 7 nanometers. You see a trend here yet. TSMC's N6 process recycled all the design rules from N7 and was completely backwards IP compatible. TSMC customers who had previously designed chips for N7 could jump right in with N6. The same should be true, in theory, with TSMC's N4 process, meaning previous N5 customers can get started right away. TSMC is also working on its enhanced N5 process, which will likely be known as N5P. This will be a 5 nanometer intranode improvement, much like what TSMC did with N7P and N7 Plus. N5P should offer an iterative speed boost at ISO power or a slight power improvement at ISO performance. Reports suggest that N5P could be ahead of schedule, with volume production rumored for May. Apple, as the largest customer of TSMC now, up there with uh, AMD, but quite a bit ahead, has also seemingly already secured TSMC's initial N4 capacity for the next wave of the Apple Silicon M series devices, the Macs, uh, for its future production. Intel has been in the news frequently lately. Some good, some not so good. But either way, Intel's back entangled this time in yet another lawsuit. This one it seems hinging on Intel allegedly violating wiretapping laws in Florida. The lawsuit claims that Intel is running third-party scripts that capture or intercept a user's electronic interactions with a website, with Intel's website. The type of data being intercepted is the problem here. It ranges from mouse clicks and mouse movements to what data is being input and what pages were visited and the dates on which they were visited. The lawsuits have been filed in a Florida court and it's being brought against Intel as a class action under the Florida Security of Communications Act and under Florida law, companies can't intentionally capture or intercept any electronic communication without prior knowledge and consent of the user. The suit claims Intel is using session replay and recording scripts to intercept these communications. And while the lawsuit doesn't mention a name, the register seems to believe it's clicktail. Additionally, by visiting Blacklight and viewing its report on Intel's webpage, it's confirmed that Intel's website is indeed loading a clicktail session and the recording script. The lawsuit is seeking trial by jury and an unspecified amount of damages. Intel is far from the only company deploying such scripts, but the lawsuit hinges on Intel being huge for one and therefore being a target, and on Intel failing to inform users of the practice. Western Digital and Micron are apparently interested in buying Kyoshi in the next story. So the Wall Street Journal is reporting on what appears to be a possible bidding war brewing over the memory maker Kyoshi. If you're not familiar with the company, it is actually a, a large manufacturer at this point. So Kyoshi was spun off from Toshiba previously when Toshiba had some money issues and the NAND flash business uh, went to Kyoshi who makes enterprise devices now, so SSDs uh, and makes consumer devices, M.2 SSDs and of large and small sizes, portable SSDs, things of that nature. That became a different company under new ownership at Bain Capital. The plan for Kyoshi was always to go public, but an IPO was put on hold last year on account of the pandemic and also various market conditions at the time, as well as ongoing geopolitical issues surrounding US-China manufacturing. According to Wall Street Journal, an IPO is still possible if a deal doesn't materialize between WD and Micron. Regarding a possible deal, Micron and Western Digital are both reportedly eyeing an acquisition of uh, $30 billion or more, according to Wall Street Journal sources. Western Digital was among many interested parties vying to buy Toshiba memory before it was sold off to Bain Capital. Kyoshi and Western Digital already cooperate a, a number of fabs together located in Japan and recently announced that they co-developed their new 162L 3D NAND flash. All that said, Western Digital certainly seems like the more likely party to pursue buying the company, doubly so considering the two companies have had a 20-year joint venture partnership at this point. However, Micron announced that it was exiting the 3D Crosspoint business recently and would no doubt jump at an opportunity to strengthen its position in the market. There hasn't been an official comment on this story from any of these companies at this point, but from what it sounds like, this is something we might learn more about in the spring of this year. Up next, Lewis Rossman in the news. So Lewis Rossman is raising funds for Right to Repair and an initiative he's emphasizing. Uh, he's been talking about this on his channel for a while now, but Lewis Rossman has started a 501c4, I believe is the classification of the group. And 
you've likely encountered him in the past on YouTube, either for his ranting while riding through New York City about things like it's it's inside but outside, which I find particularly entertaining, and you should check it out if you haven't seen it, or for his MacBook repair and rants about the right to repair and uh, working as a repair shop, getting sort of cut off by manufacturers from repairing devices, because then that means you keep the devices active longer, which reduces waste and reduces wasted money by the customer and is therefore bad because then the first party companies can't sell more devices and go on a one per one year replacement policy. So Rossman's been in the news, uh, especially recently, for moving from being a vocal and prominent right to repair activist into being more of a, a force in the space directly. Rossman has attended committee meetings and hearings in the past and provided expert testimony and uh, is now moving forward with a, uh, a, a goal of directly funding a ballot initiative to get right to repair legislation passed. And this is following the success of Massachusetts right to repair initiative from 2020, also known as question one. This was a successful amendment to the Massachusetts right to repair initiative from 2012, and it expands the law to include telematics systems and cars. To that end, Rossman has reached out to the law firm that was able to facilitate the direct ballot initiative for question one in Massachusetts and is looking to hire them to help with a direct ballot campaign with the end goal of passing right to repair legislation for the electronics industry uh, with a wider scope. Rossman is looking to raise $6 million in funds to get right to repair on ballots for 2022 and has also started a 501c4 nonprofit called Repair Preservation Group Action Fund with the goal being to help this campaign. Rossman has posted on YouTube also to inform the community uh, of a couple of key donations he's received. I saw this on the YouTube community page when scrolling through earlier today. Uh, so a couple of, of donations that Lewis Rossman has received to the group include one in the amount of 69.69. He uh, was also excited to see another donation of $420.69 and also a donation of $100,000, it sounds like, from one bank account, from what we understand. So uh, if you're interested in right to repair, and we certainly are, then check out what Lewis Rossman's doing over on his channel. You can just type in Lewis Rossman, that's two S's and two N's on YouTube and you'll find his channel. You should check out the Inside Outside New York rants too, because they're amusing. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.